everybody. My name is Luke Marr, and this is Hot Mode. And today on Hot Mode, we are coming to you with your 2023 BAFTAs Fashion Roast and Review. The BAFTAs stands for British Art Film Television Awards. Some of the best of television and film people arrived on the red carpet. They wore stuff. It wasn't great. It wasn't totally bad, though. It existed. To a degree, that's fine. But to another degree, it's like... It's like 65 degrees in February in New York, so we're really going to have a lot of fun using lots of carbon. Maybe we should make it a little bit more worthwhile. Those are my thoughts, and that goes for everybody everywhere all the time. But now, without further ado, let's get into it. Firstly, we have Anna de Armas wearing Louis Vuitton. Now, this is a custom look. It is a pink silk dress. It's sort of in a mermaid cut. It's a sort of light little silk. And we can see at the bust area, there is a frill that wraps around the top and around the bottom of the sort of bosom cage. The rest of the dress is pretty simple. It's kind of like a mermaid silhouette to a degree, at least where it's cut or at least where we can see there's a difference, in my opinion, of the slip. I presume that there is a slip and that's why you can see that up top it has the sort of much lighter sheen and reflection, whereas on the bottom it does not. Not. It also could just be the angle of, you know, the knee push, but for the most part, I presume it's a slip. I really don't know, but either way, there's an explanation for it, I'm sure. To be completely honest, I know that she probably is here and nominated for the Marilyn film, and so maybe that's why we have this light pink style. I don't know all that much about Marilyn's sort of lexicon of style, but I do know that Anna de Armas has been pretty blasé. Now, I know that this is also a custom Louis Vuitton look. As far as Louis Vuitton goes, this is not the worst simple style that I've ever seen from them. In and of itself, it's like fine, it's whatever, it's not really memorable, but I think the fit is okay, I don't think it's horrible, I don't like some of the puckering elements, but besides that, like, it's fine. But my issue is, I think what I realized with this look, and you'll see it a lot more as we go on with Louis Vuitton custom styles, I think Anna de Armas is boring and has gone a very boring route for press tour for Marilyn. And it's now annoying me. I just think there could be a little bit more oomph and excitement and pizzazz going on, especially when we look at the other custom Louis Vuitton looks later on in the video. This just feels blah and boring, not well thought out, not super interesting, not really doing like a research exercise in let me demonstrate the Maryland's experience. And I know people are gonna be like, well, they don't have to dress like, well, I think they do. That's me, okay? That's my opinion. So. I want that. I want more Marilyn references. I want more excitement. I want more intrigue. I want more pizzazz. I want more extravaganza. Okay? And Anna Darmas has not done that recently. And it's very disappointing. And I finally realized Louis Vuitton is not the problem. Next up, we have Andrea Christie, and she is wearing Rahul Mishra, who is an haute couturier who is based out of India, specifically Delhi. And Rahul has been getting a lot of praise recently when it comes to his different avant-garde, but also incredibly detailed, embroidered styles. He's one sort of to watch in the haute couture space. Now, this look is from the fall 2022 haute couture collection by Rahul Mishra, and it's pretty much a very exaggerated sleeved dress that is full of a gorgeous gold floral 3D embroidery and applique. Now the basis of the dress looks to be black and then this gold applique is put on top. You can see that it's pretty much a cocktail dress, nothing super duper crazy in terms of silhouette of the actual dress itself, but these sleeves are large and exaggerated. They are curved, almost like crescent moon cuts. And just this gold almost looks like what you would see in like Howl's Moving Castle, Studio Ghibli-esque, just detail on detail of these golden flowers. It looks like the most beautiful section of an antique shop that you've found in some random little street in some random little city. And you're like, wow, this is magic. Cause that's what it looks like. It really, it does genuinely look magical. I know some people say, oh, well, the sleeves are exaggerated. They're over the top. They look cartoonish. Yeah, I guess to a degree, but I also think that they add such an exciting silhouette. And I think oftentimes we look to the actual dress to make the silhouette so exciting. And I think here, what makes the silhouette so exciting is actually the sleeve. The sleeve gives it this sort of orb shape, which is so cool and different than what we usually see. The fact that the sleeve is so highly detailed is also 
really miraculous. I love it. I think it's exciting and fun. I think the shoes work. I don't know if they're gold or if they're silver. Oh, actually they're beaded and have a little fringe element, which I think is cute. I think they could be a little bit more gold inspired, but that's just me. Hats off to Andrea Christie. I don't know who she is and I apologize to her for that, but I appreciate that she really went for this. She really, she stuck to a cool young designer. She went for an exciting, exaggerated, over the top look. And at the same time, I think it does all of the aforementioned things, but it also is really beautiful. It makes her look super exciting, dramatic, and gorgeous at the same time and I love it. Next up we have Angela Bassett wearing Pamela Rowland. Now this is a purple halter style dress a little off the shoulder and then as we reach to around the elbow area there is a silk poof that juts out from the actual garment. We can see that the rest of the dress is pretty simple in terms of cut. There's a little slit element to sort of showcase a little bit of leg. There's a flower handbag and a sort of pink bow peep toe platform heel. I love Angela Bassett. I don't love this dress. It's sad. I like certain elements of the dress. I like the way that the off the shoulder element is cut. I think it's really nice. I like the idea of the sleeve. I just think that it's a hard thing to have the sleeve be exaggerated like this, but I don't think that the sleeve flows well. I, I feel like it's a hard stop. Oh, poof silk sleeve. I think in certain elements the fit is okay. The halter I don't think is really beautiful. The slit is fine. The bag and the shoe it's okay. It falls flat to me. I think that there should just be some connection between the sleeve and some other part of the dress. It doesn't deliver. You know what I mean? I appreciate the attempt but it falls flat. Next up we have Anya Taylor-Joy wearing Scaparelli. Now this is probably one of the more controversial looks of the evening and people you know had a lot to say about it. It's pretty much the look from the spring 2023 Haute Couture collection. It's the finale style made up of a cocktail dress in a champagne velvet with a matching shawl of champagne velvet that goes around the head and falls down to the floor but exposes back as well. We can see that the look also is taken off at a certain point by Anya and she just shows that she's wearing this sort of strapless cocktail dress. It looks to be a lot of trapezium shapes. I googled that. On one end they're long on the top and then diagonal comes down on the side and then at the bottom it's shorter than it is on the top. It flips the other way around when it comes to the waist and we can see that it's shorter on top, diagonal sides longer on bottom, and then a just sort of square rectangular shape at the very end. And it's covered in these little bows. People sort of called this dress out and said, you know, compared to the model on the runway, the color isn't exactly for her skin tone. Or they're saying that it doesn't look as good on her skin tone. Now, will I say that when we look at the model on the runway, who has a darker skin tone, this champagne velvet really pops. It does. It looks beautiful on her. It looks stunning on her. I think that the color really is wonderful and gorgeous. I also think the way that it creates sort of that wraparound wraparound style, which is very Daniel Roseberry. Also, I'd like to see a TikTok of Daniel Roseberry going wraparound. The way that Anya sort of puts it almost like a head scarf shawl mantilla. I get it. I understand it. But I think that when it looks a little collar like, it's also intriguing. It's just a different way of styling the look. But back to the skin tone thing. Listen, I don't think that this color looks bad on Anya. I just think that when you put it next to the model on the runway, of course one is gonna pop more. That's fine. But I don't think it means that Anya can't wear this champagne color in velvet. I don't think that it washes her out. I don't think it makes her look awkward or weird or bad. I just think that it's a difference of skin tone and like we can't really change the skin tone. So like people can wear it and people can also wear it. People will feel that one looks better than the other and that's fine. It doesn't mean that Anya Taylor-Joy can't wear it. Long story short, I think the color is fine. I do think that it probably should have been a little bit more steamed in terms of the shawl because we can see it really does crinkle and wrinkle a lot compared to the runway. Obviously, again, I presume that it moved a lot in transport and traffic and things like that. We should have had like two assistants, really. Going back to the actual dress itself, which I do think is really the intriguing part, I personally feel that this look is a reference to an iconic Scaparelli style that doesn't really get a lot of attention, which is the dresser drawer style. Elsa Scaparelli, I believe, worked with Salvador Dali on this concept where different pockets on an actual coat dress was had handles and elements and looked like it could be pulled out and create sort of dresser drawers. And the pockets were definitely smaller than the proportions here. But here, I feel like this is very like dresser-like where those little ribbons at the top 
almost looked like they could be pulled out and you could pull the dress out and there would be something inside of it when you pull it out or you could push it back. So I don't know if this is actually what Daniel Roseberry was referencing, but kind of looks like that. I do think it's a cool reference if it is what's going on here. It's just a nice way of tying it back into the history of Scaparelli, the idea of surrealism and clothing as a artistic interpretation. I think this is cool. I think this is fun. I think it's chic. I think it's elegant. I think it's smart. It's intellectual. All wrapped up in a nice shawl. Next up, we have Ariana DeBose, and she is wearing a Fendi look. I believe this is Fendi Haute Couture. It's pretty much a bodysuit that has a oval motif applique over a sheer long floor length gown cut with sleeves. I don't really like Fendi Haute Couture, so I don't get it a lot of the time. But here, I think that this look actually does a pretty good job of being sheer. I do think that you can really feel there's a sheer element to it. It almost looks invisible. That netting, the netting looks pretty good, pretty spot on. And we can see that it is a lighter color than Ariana DeBose's actual natural skin tone, but I don't think that it takes away from the actual natural skin tone, which I think is cool. I think the fact that we can see through it really, really well is nice. There's not a lot of seamage going on that really distracts us from the actual piece. I think the little oval motif is really, really nice. It's subtle. It's easy. It doesn't take away from the sheer element. It just adds a nice sort of optical illusion. The bodysuit it's fine. It's not really meant to be the big exciting piece in the look. Uh, I think the necklace also does a really, really great job. I feel like that's like bulgari. It's a little snake necklace. I think it's just a nice little add-in. I think it plays off of the actual metallic or pearlescent element of the little ovals on the actual dress. This is nice. Next up, we have Kate Blanchett wearing Margiela. Now, this is a look that she actually wore from the 2015 Oscars. It's a black fitted floor length dress with a sleeveless aspect to it. The jewelry, these rows and strings and strings of pearls are actually by Louis Vuitton from my understanding. I think that actually what was done here was kind of chic and elegant and nice and fun. So we can see that there is regular white pearls at the bottom, two sort of strands. And then up top, there's more of a silver pearl going on. Again, two strands. I think that with the dress, this nice, not choker effect, but cylindrical neck detail is cool. I think it's fun. I think it adds to the look. And then the thing that's really, really interesting is one strand of pearls, bottom pearlescent strand, is attached to the rest of the necklace by this big crystal diamond jewel situation going on here. I don't know if it's an actual diamond. I don't know if it's crystal. No, I'm unsure. But I do think the fact that it's attached there, but then the actual last strand doesn't sort of sit underneath the rest of them. Rather, it goes over one shoulder is really interesting and different. And I think jewelry styling, is that's not normal. It's not super duper thought about, you know what I mean? Like jewelry styling is put the necklace on, put the earrings on, put the rings on, that's it. Very rarely, I think, is jewelry played with in a stylistic sense where you are sort of manipulating the jewelry in a different manner than it's usually intended. And I like that. I don't know who Kate's stylist is, but whoever it is, hats off to you because I think that's rather rare. The other thing is, listen, like re-wearing dresses I think is cool. Kate Blanchett seems to do that a little bit. Also, I think it's nice to see. I used to not like it. I think because I was like, oh, I want to see new, I want to see exciting. But I think that also the environment's burning. So if we're going to rewear dresses every once in a while, I'm fine with it. Don't worry. You know what I mean? Like I rewear clothes on this channel all the time. Clothes are meant to be reworn. I enjoy that. I also think that like the timing, it's a solid what? Like seven years since. I think that's cool. I think that's exciting. The little blue ribbon, it's there. I'm sure it means something to the British people. And I like the sleeve or the lack of sleeve and the frayage. I think that adds little Margiela-ism into it. The idea of deconstruction, the idea of degradation of fabrics. If we zoom into the bottom of the dress, we can also see that the hem is frayed as well, which again, I think just adds to that nice Margiela-ism. And then again, just the fit of the dress is beautiful. It really is. It's a really, really beautiful fit. Just the way that it nips in, falls back out, accentuates the hips, accentuates the shoulders. That's what Margiela is. It's a really sort of simplistic brand in terms of cut and technique and things like that. It's just nice clothes. And then there is little elements of deconstruction and reconstruction wrapped in, which we all really like. So to be completely honest, I love this. I think it's a beautiful way of bringing back a look that we've already seen, but making it feel new and different and exciting. I like the manipulation of jewelry. Shout out to Capo and Chat. Next up, we have Cynthia Arriva wearing a custom Louis Vuitton look. It is copper style made up of a lot of little pieces of appliqued strips. Now we can see that it is a sleeveless experience. It comes up and sort of wraps around the neck. 
And then we can see descends down, exposes the shoulders, and wraps into the bodice. We can see that at the bodice, it's very straightforward. These pieces really lay right on top of each other. But as we can see around the sort of collarbone area, there is a flowing out of these styles, and they're not as stiff and organized as they are on the bodice. They flow out. And then on the other side, there's just a whole archipelago going on up top. We can see that this sort of piece sort of branches out and then comes right back down into the actual bodice. Creates like a sharp, interesting line. I don't really love it. I, I get that it's meant to be a little bit futuristic and a little bit sort of architectural, I would say, but I don't love it. I just think it kind of detracts a little bit. As we get to around the hip area, we can see that these strips no longer are tacked down and as organized rather they become fringy and they sort of move and groove and create a flowing out and loose end element to them. We can also see that at the back of the dress there's a little bit of a train of them that flows out which actually I think is really exciting and exaggerated and fun and frisky and cool. The look as a whole I like Cynthia Erivo's going for it always. I think the skirt is really really wonderful. I think it's super exciting. I think the color is fantastic on her. I think though there should be a little bit more of this fringy tasseliness going on in the bodice area. I think that the architectural structure coming out here diverts away from what's going on in terms of the skirt. I also think that a little bit of the fringy going on on the bodice too would make it a little bit more exciting. And I think that there's a hard split right at the hip where we can see the tack down element really dichotomizes from the fringy element of the skirt and it's pretty noticeable. I do like what's going on around the collar area because it's trying to bring in the skirt to the top, but I don't think it does it enough. I love where it was going. I just think a few too many ideas going into it and that sort of hurts the look overall. When we're talking about that added to armus look earlier, I just want to say again, like creativity, excitement, extravagance, interest and in technique is here. It's not there. Next up, we have Daniel Deadweiler, who is wearing Armani Privé. It's a blue silk dress with a little black silk top hood situation going on over the neckline. You can also see that there's a black sort of silk strap that goes and runs along and sort of creates a non-strapless effect. Now, the dress sort of runs down, creates a nice, easy skirt effect. You know, it hits the floor well. I think it adds a sort of liquidity to it in this nice blue. It feels very water-like. I like the actual cut of the dress. The thing I don't think really works is the green, black, and very light blue embroidered and appliqued waist belt. I don't think it works. I think it takes away from the actual fit of the dress that is really, really rather nice. And I understand that we're trying to add an element of intrigue and interest and excitement to it. And I think that's fine. But I think that this is not the interest and intrigue and excitement that we want from Armani. You know what I mean? Like I want to see a beautiful embroidery that is actually woven into the, the gown. I'm not saying that it has to necessarily be woven. Armani is better off doing it as a real sort of part of the dress rather than an exaggerated, excited area. And because I think that this takes away from a, the cut of the dress, the way that it's draped, the way that it fits, which is beautiful. It really makes a hard stop like, oh, what is that? Oh, what is that? I don't think that the colors do a bad job. I don't think that they take away. I think also like the black stripes running through plays into the little strap element on the dress. I think the blue is trying to play off of the blue and the green I think does look good with the rest of the colors. It's not a bad color story whatsoever. I just think that it's hard to put this non-languid belt over a very languid dress, if that makes sense. It's hard to wrap your head around or around your waist. I like the idea of the dress. I like the fit and the structure of the dress. I just think that the belt is a little awkward, but I like the colors too. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a preferential thing for people. Next up, we have Eddie Redmayne and Hannah Bradshaw. Now they have been showing up wearing the same brand, two red carpets, and I really like it because I think it's very rarely done where, you know, a couple sort of shows up on a red carpet and wears the same brand. And personally, I think it's very necessary. I think that if you're going to go and show up as a couple and take all your pictures together, like there should be some continuity between your looks. Here, it's happening. We can see that Hannah is wearing a sheer dress and it's full of floral embroidery in green, red, pink, orange, purple. I think there's probably elements of yellow. Is it sort of very pretty Sarah Burton styles? Does it probably have references in terms of motif to like Victorian ceramics or embroideries and things like that? Yes, I'm sure it does. And the thing is, it's also a sheer sort of black dress. It showcases off much of the body, which 
to me is kind of McQueenie in and of itself. But at the same time, I think Sarah Burton brings a lot more conservatism to the Alexander McQueen brand. She does do sheer here. It's just that she also is doing something that feels a little bit more buttoned up in terms of the floral motifs and things like that. But even the florals, like I think that the way that they're done with, you know, the little imprints of silver all throughout the way that they sort of degrade, you know, there's blank areas and spaces. I also think is like kind of nice. It's it's not my favorite Alexander McQueen dress by far. I mean, it, you know, it's hard to see sort of modern Alexander McQueen and be like, oh, oh. but I don't think that this is a bad dress at all. I think that it's nice. I think it works. I think it's fun. I think it plays to the house codes. I just think it does it in a different manner. And I have become okay with that. And it's okay. I'm good. As for Eddie Redmayne, though, we're, we're going to have to dive away from the picture of him and had it together because Eddie is wearing a black suit jumpsuit, which I like. Listen, Eddie, I feel like for the longest time has been so boring and so blah. And I feel like recently he is trying to step it up, trying to be exciting, trying to be fun and frisky. And it's working because I'm into all of those things. So it's pretty much a black silk suit jacket style but in reality you can see at the hip area that the suit jacket sort of just goes straight into this pair of pants we can see that there is a front pleat falls down really easy really breezy really beautiful the no shirt underneath i kind of like i think it's different normally somebody would wear a shirt and a tie and i think here eddie doing just shirtless is fun and it's different i like the silhouette on him i think that it works really really well i know that he used to be a model so i think he can like pull off sort of avant-garde men's wary kind of vibes and i think this is that to a degree it's a little bit more focused on the history of tailoring things like that you can see it in the pants we can see it in the suit jacket you know the lapels and all that sort of stuff but definitely different than your traditional suit because it's really not a suit it's a jump suit so i like this evolution for eddie redmayne he's still doing classic easy fabrics and things like that but he's trying little by little to make the tailoring a little bit more different, a little bit more exciting, a little bit more modern, and I'm into it. I'm happy with these McQueen moments. Next up, we have Florence Pugh, who is wearing Nina Ricci, designed by Harris Reed. Now, this is a custom look, and we have yet to really see what Harris Reed's Nina Ricci looks like, except for the fact that we've been seeing a little bit of it on the red carpet. Now, this is a full tulle gown with a mermaid cut and a very large frond asymmetrical neck detail situation going on. Now, the thing about Nina Ricci is it is a hard brand to really pin down what the aesthetics and house codes are because for the longest time it was not really seen as like a chic brand in the way that Dior and Balenciaga and Jacques Fath and Viennne and Madame Grey and Chanel and all of those brands were seen. It was kind of seen as more French aristocracy, not homely, but definitely less sort of international, less global takeover development. It was much more a French brand for the French, at least from what my reading says. Now, this dress is actually based on a look that was designed for the spring 1988 collection. I don't know if it was haute couture or not, but it's this large strapless orange gown with an asymmetrical tulle skirt, the sort of similar, less exaggerated frondage going on at the neckline area. When I look at the original, I'm kind of like, okay, I get it, the color, it's nice, it's easy, it's fun. The fake flower sort of detail at the waist area, I understand it, but again, very 80s. I understand why he took inspiration from a look coming out of the 80s, because a lot of his work does reference the 70s and the 80s. As for the actual Florence Pugh dress, it's much neon and much richer in terms of color. It's, it's a much sort of punchier orange than the sort of mandarin orange color, I would say, that we see in the original. The frond detail does a good job of paying homage to the style from 1988. It's just that the fronds are a little bit more exaggerated and large, but they do this element where come under her right breast and sort of wrap around the breast, go down and then re-wrap around on the left breast, which I think is interesting. I think it does sort of pay homage to the original look. And it's cool that Harris is redefining or at least trying to define house codes for Nina Ricci customers who either don't really know that much about the brand or not at all interested in the brand and want to sort of get a little bit of a history lesson in it. As we can see, the actual bodice of the dress is draped and creates an intriguing sort of texture to it, runs all the way down and around the knee area in the midst of the 
thigh. We can see that this mermaid skirt juts out asymmetrically. And to be completely honest, listen, we see a lot of tool styles. We've discussed this sort of ad nauseum at this point. It's kind of not super rare to see tool. But I think when you do see tool now, it's important for a brand and a designer to really make it exciting and interesting and cool and fun. To be completely honest, I think that doing this sort of asymmetrical mermaid silhouette, it's good. I think that it looks at the actual skirt from 1988 and does a good job of sort of, again, modernizing it, making it a little bit more relevant for this sort of age and this sort of experience. You don't want to do too 80s heavy. You want to do something a little bit more exciting that people would say, oh, I want to wear that. And I think that this is a dress that people could look at and say, oh, I want to wear that. I think the way that it flows out is nice. I don't think it's a crazy dress, but I do think that for the most part, it does a good job of looking at the reference image, modernizing it, changing it, shifting it, and making it feel a little bit more youthful and exciting. The color, I think, works. I think taking off certain elements like flowers is what needs to happen. And I'm excited to see what Florence and Harris do with Nina Ricci because I feel like there's growing camaraderie between the two of them because I think that Florence just walked for Harris collection for Harris Reed that Harris does in London. I'm intrigued. I'm excited. We have Gugu Mbatha Raw and she is wearing Gucci. Now this is a custom style made up of a whole lot of lace and a whole lot of chain mail to be completely honest. If we start at the top we can see that there are these chain mail or crystallized sort of straps that hold up the dress which I think is actually kind of nice and chic and cool. And then as we reach the neckline we can see that it's a beige lace that seems to be placed over top of a chain mail like the chain mail or crystals. I guess it's maybe not chain mail. It's more crystals like the crystals going on on these sort of opera gloves that I actually do kind of really like. Now listen, we have Sabato de Cerno who is going into Gucci and becoming the new creative director. I presume that he already started. He's showing his first collection in the next few days. And for the most part, it seems like he's keeping an element of Alessandro's work, which is lace. I mean, we did see a lot of lace from Alessandro from very, very early collection, but it seems like Sabato is also trying to give it a little bit of a newer sort of lighter feel. It's less granny chic. Again, you're adding the crystals underneath it. What I do love is this green floral lace that comes in around the waist area. It's intriguing because it cuts into the sort of beige lace. I think that minty color plays off of both the silver and the sort of beige really, really well. And then we can see that it's lined in crystals too. And then we can see that these hard cut divots bring us into the hip. We can see that the beige sort of comes back in. We can see still the crystal is underneath it and some little pleat effects flow out as well and come down and create a little bit of a train and a little bit of texture that's different than the lace and the crystals. I like it. I think that it's smart. I think it's fun. I think it's different. It's not exactly what we would have seen from Alessandro at Gucci. I think that this kind of works. It's weird, it's wacky, it takes a little bit of time to digest, but to be completely honest, I feel full without feeling like sick from it. And I think that's that's good digestion. Next up, we have Gwendolyn Christie, who is wearing Giles Deacon, who is a fashion designer based out of London and also happens to be Gwendolyn's partner or husband. I think they're married. I don't know if they're married, but like, a, you know, they're in a relationship and they've been in a relationship for, I think about like 10 years. If we're looking at the dress, we can see that up top, there is a black latex sort of style on the shoulders and at collar neck area. We can see that the neck actually kind of comes up rather high, then dips down and then we can see the shoulders fan out, the collar element fans out, but as we reach right to where the bust area begins, we can see that a pleated black fabric, which is like really intricately pleated, like those pleats are tiny, 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 come and start and hit right to around the waist area. It adds a really intriguing geometric design. We can see that the shoulders flare all the way out, and the fact that it's sleeveless allows the sort of pleats, which come down and in to make a really rather intriguing sort of structure and silhouette. Geometric line based, it's line heavy. And I think also the fact that the pleats seem to really be the exciting, extravagant element but I think that the latex does a good job of not really taking away and rather fading into the background of the actual look, which I think is hard for latex to normally do. For Giles Deacon, I mean, like, I stand. The waist is a latex, so I think the waist sort of nips in, and I don't think you'd get the full nip-in effect at the waist with pleats. I think that they're meant to be a little bit more voluminous and extravagant and over Whelming, and I think that the waist sort of nips in perfectly and then it juts right back into these pleats There are tiers of these pleats and as we can see they get longer and longer as we get further and further down the dress and to be completely honest when we look at it from a farther viewpoint I thought that it was just a sort of silk that was gathered rather tightly but not too tightly to create this sort of wave but if we zoom in again we can see that the pleats are 
there. Like they are, they're there. They create the shape, but they also have a shape in and of themselves. They create a nice texture to them when you zoom in. And the full effect is really beautiful. The silhouette is fantastic on her. I think that it fits her beautifully. I love, love, love the bodice area. I think it's chic and elegant and wonderful. The idea of nipping in the waist and then letting the fabric sort of again jut out and create an exaggerated silhouette to a degree. It's really lovely. Again, I just think the texture play is really nice. And I think Gwendolyn really pulls off a full black gown like this so, so well. And again, I think it fits in with her whole aesthetic of not being goddamn boring all the time. She just isn't. She's one that carries the team on her back almost all of the time. And this feels a little bit more glamour. And I think it's a great way of showing that you can do glamour without being boring. Next up we have Hong Chao and she is wearing Erdem. Now this is an asymmetrical sort of ball gown style. It has a white bodice coming in. We can see the straps and then an asymmetrical off the shoulder large strap that seems to be printed in some sort of sketch motif. It looks almost like an artist sort of pre-sketch that's done with a pen or pencil. It's not sort of colored in with paints and all those sorts of things. It feels honestly rather doodle-esque but intricate doodles. Doesn't look like my doodles. My doodles will never look like that. But if you're looking at famous artists, maybe they're doodles. We can see as we move down the dress that these doodles are a little bit more intricate. We can see trees and sort of swags of fabrics, what looks like arms and legs and things like that. Listen, I like it. I think that it's a very Erdem sort of shape. I think ball gown silhouette done sort of modernly. It's not like it nips in the waist and is super duper tight like Dior new look. It's just sort of normal. It's intriguing. I think it works. And then the elements of asymmetry, whether it's sort of the off the shoulder or the little sort of front frill that goes down diagonally on the sort of hip thigh area and then just sort of falls down easily. It's nothing crazy. I like it. I think it's okay. I think it's very Erdem. I do think there are more exciting Erdem looks that we could have seen, but to be completely honest, I think that this has a graphic element, a graphic detail that we don't normally see. I'm intrigued by it. Next up we have Ho Yeon Jung and she is wearing Louis Vuitton. She is a Louis Vuitton woman. This is a strapless ball gown and it looks a little bit like a Christmas present, kind of don't mind it. Listen, the silhouette in and of itself, again, it's very opulent, but it's kind of simple in terms of there's nothing really super duper crazy about it. It's a strapless dress with a big bouffant skirt that falls and really lays itself on the floor. The gathering is not really crazy. It just sort of creates these nice little folds in the front. The fabric in and of itself is this gold that seems to be woven that way. You know, I don't think it's been embroidered or applicated. I think that it's meant to have this sort of gold crunchy feeling to it. It's fine. I don't love it. I don't hate it. It's fine. I do think that the jewelry could have been a little bit more exciting. You know what I mean? Like you have a whole lot of neck area, a whole lot of neck real estate going on. Something fun and cool and chic and elegant would have been great. I know that Louis Vuitton does jewelry, so I feel like it could have been cool to do a little bit more exciting or exaggerated jewelry piece to play off of the dress. But to be completely honest, like I think it's nice to see that LV can simple, easy silhouette, but do it in maybe a little bit more of a futuristic or out there material and textile. Next up, we have Jamie Lee Curtis. I don't know who she's wearing, but it's a black velvet double-breasted blazer and a white silk skirt. To be completely honest about the look, it's pretty bad. You know what I mean? Like it's a black velvet blazer paired over a white skirt and we pretty much just said, okay. Could have been like the new Halloween movie. It's kind of a horror. I don't think the styling is great. I don't think whatever. It just, it doesn't work. We all know that. We can all see that. It's giving me like bad indigestion. Like I need an Activia now to like fix it. My one thing is I feel like, feel like, I don't know if this is true. Jamie Lee didn't, she didn't DM me. I don't know. You know, we didn't talk on the phone, but I feel like she's maybe trying to do some sort of like Edwardian aesthetic, something maybe a little Victorian in terms of like very long sort of flowing skirt with a jacket, which to me feels very British woman of the manor. I feel like we're trying to do something that's a little bit like Duchess, Lady, Baroness kind of vibe where we're just going old school English. I just don't think it works. You know what I mean? Like, listen, if you pulled out some like old Galliano look or old McQueen, because I feel like Jamie Lee Curtis can afford like a nice vintage McQueen moment where we really go full estate, full side saddle ride, Sandringham, you know, Christmas Day hunt. I'd be into that. You know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a Christopher John Rogers look that I think perfectly captures that sort of old school British vibe. It just feels like it's something that could have been made off Savile Row. I would have loved that. I think that would have captured this idea of the BAFTAs and old school sort of British aristocracy and things like that. But if that's what she's going for, which is what I think she was going for, it's not this at all. This is not. This is like modern British aristocracy. To be completely honest, not the vibe. 
so rough. Next up, we have Jody Turner Smith in a custom Gucci look. I like this. I think it's fun. I think it's different. I think it's exciting. Now, listen, we can see that there's continuity between Gugu Mbatha Raw's look, which was had an underdress of crystals. We can see that there's an element of crystallization running throughout the entirety of this dress, except for the shoulder and collar area. It's a purple net mesh style that we can see elements of, I believe, lace running throughout sort of on the top there's an asymmetrical crystal sort of bodice that runs diagonally down we can see the sleeves also have this sort of crystallization and then there's big flows of feathers at the ends of the sleeves they seem to be at least from on the left side of jody they seem to be very long sort of sleeves big long very dramatic very exaggerated. And then as we move down the dress, we can see that it goes this crystal root and then these purple sort of feathers in like a diagonal band that wraps down and around. Then we have more of the crystals, feathers, crystals, feathers. I love it. Jodi always kind of goes for it. She's always a little bit over the top, always a little bit avant-garde. I think that this is fun and it's weird and it's frisky and it's cool. I think the feathers do a great job of exciting and different. They're full. It's not like that little light dainty feather where it's like evidently we didn't have enough feather really make it look dense like a dense forest here we have this beautiful sort of lilac and regular purple forest of feathers running throughout the whole dress i think the necklace does a good job of sort of again bringing that silver back up to the sort of neck area the feathers the way that they hit the ground is also just luscious and lovely the way that the purple also sort of melts in with the crystals is also intriguing and cool and different the addition of the lace i think helps to sort of bring the gap a little bit smoothly. I love it. Even like the makeup. If we zoom in, I'm not a makeup person, but like, I love this. This is cool. This is different. It plays into the look. It's what we need. It's what we want. We were talking about Doja Cat a while ago and like the dedication to the fashion element. And I feel like everybody's like, oh shit, we kind of got to serve a look. And it seems like everybody's kind of learning we got to serve a look. So thank you to Jody. I appreciate this. Thank you to Gucci. I appreciate this. This is fun. This makes me happy. Next up, we have Julianne Moore wearing Saint Laurent. This is a black strapless dress. It's a full length gown, no sleeves. There's nothing really crazy to it. There's not a lot of drape element. It's fitted, falls in a very clean sort of column. I don't love it. I don't hate it. It's just kind of there. What is meant to be the exciting part is this white marabou feather jacket. It is faux in case you did not know. I believe that all of Kering does faux feathers. And to be completely honest, from afar, it looked pretty real. When we zoom in, we can see it's a little bit more, I would say, synthetic looking. But I think that it's kind of intriguing. I think doing a little shawl element, I get it. It feels very 70s glamour. I feel like we saw it with Hailey Bieber at the Met Gala this year, or last year, technically. I understand it. I just think it's a little blase. But maybe Julianne is doing just sort of classic, easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl. And like, I don't hate it. I don't love it. Again, it's just there. Next up, we have Lashana Lynch wearing Fendi Haute Couture. This is a custom look. It feels like it's inspired by the most recent Fendi collection, but to be honest, like I looked through, I couldn't really find anything. So we have this sort of intriguing shawl sort of neckline. It definitely sort of gathers up top and creates an intriguing texture. As we hit right around the collarbone, like I literally can see on the collarbone, it changes and it goes full sort of flat, easy, flows down and hits right around the sort of waist area on the bodice element. And then on the sleeves, it flows all the way down creates like a, a cape then we can see that the skirt you know, they're met at that seam it's kind of awkward and weird and I don't really like it I just don't think it flows well it's haute couture I feel like it should be effortless and easy and it should be something where you look at it and say oh my gosh how did they make that? I think the skirt is awkward and weird, hits at a weird place, like using the caftan sort of sheer fabric and then the opaque silk, like it just looks awkward. It looks blah and boring. And I think that's my issue with Fendi Haute Couture is I love the idea of Fendi Haute Couture. I think historically it was really cool. It was artisanal fur and artisanal playing with different fabrics to manipulate them into looking like fur if they weren't doing fur necessarily, which is what Fendi started to do over time. The idea of Fendi doing a spring show to me just doesn't make sense with fur. It's a fur house. Listen, they've always historically only done these haute couture collections as fall shows because that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like it makes sense that you're doing a show as a fur house that's meant to sort of push and exaggerate and excite this idea of fur only in fall and winter seasons. And so my issue is Fendi is not an haute couture house historically. Karl Lagerfeld was an haute couturier in the sense of he knew how to make haute couture because he had worked for haute couturiers. 
Kim Jones is not an haute couturier. It's not his thing. He is a commercial product juggernaut, which I respect to the utmost degree, but like, this is not great haute couture. And that's my issue is listen, put out a fall show every year and make it the best thing since sliced bread. And I'll sit there and I'll clap like the rest of them. But this to me, it's just, it feels unnecessary. I don't think Fendi needs a spring haute couture show. And I think that this proves there's not enough time going into it to make it feel even like, oh, well, I get why we're doing a spring show because there's so much pizzazz there. It doesn't deliver. I don't think Lashana necessarily looks bad. I just don't think the dress should be considered haute couture. Next up, we have Lily James wearing Tamara Ralph. It's pretty much a plunging white silk dress. There's a web crystallized element that runs up and looks a bit like a spider web. There's a floor length skirt with a little bit of a drape in the center that runs all the way down. And then there's a back skirt that flows sort of back and all the way around and creates like a little bit of an intriguing silhouette. But for the most part, I don't like it. I think it's a little too simple. I think it's a little too basic. It doesn't deliver. I think the asymmetrical poof on one of the sides is weird. I think the crystal element at bust area doesn't connect to anything. It just doesn't feel like the Lily James we've seen recently, and that's disappointing. Next up, we have Madeline Arthur wearing John Batista Valley. It's pretty crisp, classic, easy John Batista. It's a bright pink. It's floaty and frothy. It's gathered so, so much that we can see it really does create a sort of intriguing texture. The plunge is different and interesting and cool. The bow is a very John Batista Valley aesthetic. And the thing is, I don't love it, but I also like the fact that at least there's not the full reflective silk here that wraps all the way around the waist. It's not like it's trying to make this bow the waist nipper. The band that wraps around at least is sort of the same fabric as the rest of the dress. It's there. You know what I mean? I don't love it. I don't hate it. It's easy sort of commercial John Batista. I think that Madeline could have went for something a little bit more exciting in terms of John Batista Valley. Could have been pushed, but I don't hate the dress. I just don't love it either. It's just there. On anybody else, you know, a nice Sunday tea at some nice place uptown, I'd say, sure, gorgeous, wonderful. But on the red carpet, I want a little bit more pizzazz. Next up, we have Michelle Yeoh in Dior my queen. I love her. She looks amazing. This is fantastic. So this is a beautiful sort of champagne silk suit. It is sort of a cape double breasted blazer jacket. I love it. I think when I see this silhouette from Maria Grazia Curie, every single time I think she's done it. It's a gorgeous silhouette. I will say that there are moments with Maria Grazia that I say she looks good. I'm not going to ever deny when something that she does looks good. And I think that this is an example of looks good. I love the cut of the jacket. I think it's beautiful. The double breasted element is gorgeous. We can still see even though it's a double breasted blazer, it nips in the waist. It feels sort of new look-esque, at least in terms of shape underneath. But I like the fact that we can have this sort of cape that comes down and creates more of a trapezine shape. Learn something new, continuity. I think the color again is just really, really gorgeous. I think it's really, really stunning. I think it's lovely. The little lapels are gorgeous. They're wonderful. They're fun. They're chic. The pants, I think maybe the pant could fit a little bit better. I love the front crease. I think it's cool. I think it adds that tailored element. I just think that we can see it's a little wavy, a little wavy. So it's maybe a little bit long for me, but I don't think it takes away from the top. Like the top in and of itself could win. It could win an Oscar. It is function, fashion, chic eleganza, simplicity to the umpteenth degree, which fits in with all of Maria Grazia Curie's Dior aesthetics. The shoes I don't love. The jewelry I think is fun. I think it works. I think it plays into everything. I like even the sort of drop hang earring. I think it's nice. I think it adds in with the cape element of the flow and the drop. Maybe fit the pants a little bit better. But besides that, Michelle Yeoh in Christian Dior by Maria Grazia, I'm into it. Next up, we have Nicola Coughlin wearing Valentino Haute Couture. I love this as well. Listen, this feels like old school 1950s, 1960s Haute Couture aesthetics to me. I just love this full, full, full skirt. I love the sleeves. I love the nice neckline. I like the fit of it. I love the way that it nips in the waist just a little bit, not super dramatic, and then flows out into this big, long, floor-length bouffant bell skirt. It's a magical silhouette. It reminds me of old Dior. It reminds me of old Balenciaga. It reminds me of sort of the greats of the 20th century haute couture, and like it makes me happy. And the thing that I like about this dress as well is it's in this gorgeous sort of creamy silk. It's really lovely, and I think Pierre Paolo is 
very smart, not only for the silhouette and all those sorts of things, but I think the actual motif here of these flowers is what really makes it feel modern. I think a lot of the times you can look back at those old sort of styles and see, oh, you know, the, the motifs, the flower sort of prints are very, very dated. You know, they're beautiful for when they were, but I think in a modern context, you wouldn't really wear them because they would feel a little bit older. They skew a little bit more old school. Some people could wear them and they would wear them and I love that for them, but I think that for a younger sort of audience who loves the silhouette, they might want something a little bit more modern in terms of print. And I think that this sort of rose print in gray and black and white with just those two little leaves in that bright blue that doesn't really take away too, too much. It's nice. It feels cool. It feels young. It feels different. And I think that that is what is sort of smart about this dress as well. The little sort of perforations of flowers also running throughout it is cool and chic and nice. Honestly, love this dress. Think it's fantastic. Think she looks great. Valentino did a great job. Next up, we got a controversial look. Prince William and the Duchess Kate. We got Will wearing a double-breasted velvet suit, jacket, bow tie, white shirt, black pants. I hate the shoes. It's blah. I mean, like, he's the king. He wants to do normal. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, I get it. The one thing that I will say about this look is... Kate has already worn this look to the BAFTAs, I believe. It's an Alexander McQueen dress by Sarah Burton. I like this dress a lot. I think it looks beautiful on her. I think that that white is really crisp and clean. I think that it fits her phenomenally. The way that the drape sort of runs asymmetrically and then sort of creates a bow and flows down on the one side feels rather e exciting for Kate. Kate is not really a super exciting fashion girl. I understand why the context of who she is and what she does, it makes sense why, but it still is very blatantly obvious. Kate is kind of basic, but I get it. But I think that this dress does a great job of being simple, not basic, and also being very fashion forward. The way that the dress falls down and sort of creates a nice little, you know, lettuce-y sort of hem at the bottom. I love it. I think that it's great. I think there's continuity to it. I just think that she looks wonderful in it. And I think that the black gloves here, the black opera gloves that a lot of people find very controversial, I think work. I really truly think works. I think that it adds a little bit of flair, a little bit of excitement, a little bit of difference on Kate that we normally wouldn't see on her. I do have an issue, you know, I don't know if this is a Princess Diana reference, but I feel like a lot of the times it was both Megan and Kate, they would do this like Princess Diana cosplay which I hated. I still hate it to this day, but I hated it so much when they were both doing it because it just felt like, listen, make your own fashion moments. I have the pictures of Princess Diana and I love them. I don't need you to do bad recreations of them. And so I feel like here, this is a look that I could say, Kate looks great. She looks radiant. This feels like a Kate moment. It feels like Kate is doing simple, elegant, beautiful. It could be kind of memorable. I also like the fact that she rewears stuff. I think that in the context that we're currently in, in the global economy, a lot of inflation, a lot of talks about recession and things like that, it makes sense why Kate would rewear a dress. I also don't think that Kate necessarily has to rewear a dress, which I also think is interesting. Not to like bring up Meghan and Harry and Kate and Will. I think I'm going to make a TikTok about it actually. But I do think that it's interesting that Kate is rewearing a dress when in reality, if she didn't rewear a dress and had a whole new dress made by Alexander McQueen or some other designer, I don't think that she would get flack for it. So the fact that she is rewearing it, I do think is interesting. And I do think that she is very cognizant of what her wardrobe demonstrates to the public, the British public, and also the public of the different areas of the Commonwealth. To be completely honest, I think Kate is very smart. I think she understands to a degree what looks good on her. I really like the dress. So those are my thoughts. Next up, we have Rosie Huntington Whiteley. She's wearing a Laya. Listen, I like this. I know that my last Rosie Huntington Whiteley experience, you know, some people were a little bit mad about. It's fair. But I think that this is a great moment where I say, oh, Rosie, excuse me. You look fantastic. She's wearing a black turtleneck bodysuit. It looks like it's sheer, but I don't think it actually is. It's very Alaya. It's very chic. It's very elegant, very sort of king of cling fitted. What I think is really, really interesting by Peter Moulier is the fact that he did this skirt that in reality is held up sort of like a belt and then the sort of black pieces of fabric jut in. And if we zoom in really, really close, we can see that there's actually a clear piece of plastic with grommets, which is a very Azadine Alaya thing he loved. The man loved a grommet. He loved a stud. They loop in to this sort of center piece with the grommets. And at the same time, the clearness and the way that the fabric is cut, it allows us to see sort of part of the groin 
leg area, which I think is intriguing and different and fun. And then it has a little bit of a flow out. The slit is there so we can see the legs sort of moving. It's not the craziest Aliyah look, but I think that it's very intriguing in the way that it is showcasing the body. Aliyah was a brand that was big on showcasing the body. And I think it was big on showcasing the body in different, intriguing, non-conventional ways. And I think that this is a good example of that. Instead of it being like, here's a hole with my crotch, it's very smartly done where it shows only certain parts. It's not vulgar, rather it's intriguing and chic and elegant. And so I'm very into it. Next up we have Sheila Atim wearing Prada. Now this is a custom look. It's a silver metallic strapless dress with matching gloves. I love the matching gloves. I think that if you're a celebrity and you're wearing a dress and you're going to, oh, I don't know, wear a pair of gloves with it, make sure that they're in the exact same fabric and they match and they're super chic and elegant because I think this is a great example of fits like a glove, it looks fantastic, and it keeps a continuity throughout the entirety of the look. This strapless dress we can see is wrinkled and it's filled with different crystal encrustments running all throughout it. I'm gonna be honest, I love it. I think we've been seeing this textile manipulation for quite some time. I think it's based on spring 2023, but it's also based on past product collections. Watch any of the videos where we talk about it. It's from, you know, 2004, 2009, the things like that. I love it. And I think that here in this metallic silver fabric, it's also great. I think oftentimes it's really easy to get fabric that looks like it's tin foil when you do a silver. I think it's so, so easy and so many designers do it. This doesn't look like tin foil to me. This feels much more tangible. It feels much more crinkled and wrinkled and it doesn't reflective tin foily fabric. Rather, it reads, this is silver. It's not aluminum. It's not mercury. It's not any of those crunchy, dunchy tin things. Rather, it's a silver. I love the little back sort of skirt that comes out. I think it adds a nice sort of shape to the rest of the dress because we can see it really as like a column sort of skirt in the front and the way that it tapers itself down I think is really lovely. The crystal elements that run throughout it, really you can't see them all that much, but if you zoom in, you can. And I think that they just add a nice sort of history of Prada in terms of adding crystallization and embellishments and embroideries and appliques. Like I think the necklace works. I think that it doesn't take away from the dress. Rather, I think it enhances it. I think Sheila Atim is a Prada girl and it makes me very happy, so. Thank you. Next up, we have Sophie Turner wearing Louis Vuitton. Listen, here's my thing again. If you look at this lace dress with all of these little different crystals and pieces that run all throughout it in all different ways, it's a great example of how, like, again, Louis Vuitton does custom and Louis Vuitton does exciting custom on, for the most part, not on occasion, it's for the most part, they do rather out there, avant-garde, sort of intriguing, cool style. So to not utilize the LV custom atelier in that manner is a disappointment. The black lace I think is cool. I think it reads a little bit older, but the way that the dress fits, because it really does fit her phenomenally, I think it gives it a little bit more youth and a little bit more beauty and a little bit more excitement. And then I think there's something about all these different little gems and crystals that look like they would be brooches or buttons or part of a big sort of necklace with these little pieces as sort of the main shining examples. I think it's cool. I think it feels avant-garde. I think it feels artistic. I think it feels like something you would find in a designer slash an artist, Nick Cave, that I saw at the Guggenheim recently. Something about him finding all these old sort of trinkets, whether it was on the street or in vintage markets or antique stores or things like that, and him sort of making them really beautiful and collaging them together. So intriguing and cool. And I feel like to a degree, this has a similar sort of effect. I'm not saying that I think Nicolas Jasquier ripped off Nick Cave. I just think that that idea of finding antique things and making them, curating them, I would say, is intriguing here in this element. It's not a dress I would pick out ever and be like, oh, I love it. But I think that Sophie Turner really pulls it off well. And finally, we have Viola Davis in a custom Stella McCartney. This purple is lovely on her. It's pretty much a fitted slip. It's full of these sort of purple crystals. And then added to this slip is a little cape element. I like it. I think it's fun. I think it's chic. I think it does a good job of feeling young and flirty and cool and elegant. But at the same time, I think the cape adds a little bit of grand or a little bit of opulence to it, but it doesn't like take itself too seriously, which I like. And I think Viola I've been like struggling with a little bit recently, but I think this is like a nice moment where I can say, mm. so let's talk about best and worst. For best, let's put in Andrea Christia in Rafa Mishra. I love that. Let's put in Kate Blanchett in that Margiela and Louis Vuitton. I'm going to add in Google Mbatha Raw in Gucci, Gwendolyn Christie in Giles Deacon, Jody Turner Smith in Gucci. I love that. Nicola Coughlin, Sheila Atim. As for worst, Ana de Armas, mm, 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 Angela Bassett, Lee Curtis, 
Lily James, Prince William. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching this BAFTAs review. I hope you guys enjoyed. Please let me know what you guys think of all the looks in the comments down below. I will see you guys in the next video and TTY. Oh.